Hi there. Good morning, and thank you for joining us at CIO Leadership Live. I'm Mary Fran Johnson. I'll be your host for the show today. And I'm very pleased to have Greg Simpson with us, the Chief Technology Officer at Synchrony Financial. And for all of those who are watching us live on LinkedIn or Twitter or on YouTube on the IDG Tech uh, Tech Talk channel, I want to encourage you to join in the conversation. Please just type in your questions. We keep a watch on all of those feeds, and I will be able to pass them along and ask them directly uh, of our guest today. So Greg joined, Greg Simpson joined Synchrony in 2014 as a Senior Vice President and Chief Technology Officer. He works closely with Synchrony's CIO on developing and implementing technology strategy. As the CTO, he oversees a fairly enormous global team. He is responsible for everything from enterprise architecture and advanced data analytics to the operations and impact of the data centers to the voice and data networks to end user services. And on top of all that, he is the head of all the AI efforts that are going on at this financial services company. Synchrony Financial is based in Stamford, Connecticut, and it is number 173 on the Fortune 500 list. It's got about $18 billion in revenue and more than 16,000 employees. It was spun out from GE Capital Bank in 2014 and offers consumer financing and savings products through Synchrony Bank, its wholly on owned online banking subsidiary. Before he joined Synchrony, Greg served as General Electric CTO for eight years, creating shared services infrastructure team that supported all of the various GE businesses. His extensive IT career spans more than 30 years. He was 30 years with GE, where he served in a number of business CTO roles in healthcare, aviation, and the lighting business. Greg has been interviewed and quoted on business technology trends in the Wall Street Journal, USA Today, in our former CIO magazine, and he also writes a series of columns called Experiencing Digital for the IDG Contributor Network. It's delightful to have you here today, Greg. Thanks for joining us. Thank you very much, Mary Fran. Good to be here. Yes, yes, sir. Let's start out um, at that 30,000-foot view above Synchrony Financial and taking a look at the disruption that's going on in the financial services industry and the kind of impact you're seeing from that competitive landscape on your job as the CTO. Well, financial services is changing every day. You know, people expect their payments to be frictionless. They expect to be able to interact in new ways with their financial institutions. Mm -hmm. So started years ago with more, more and more mobile, but now it's expanding beyond that to be, you know, total, totally different levels of customer experience. Yeah. And so as that changes and the expectations change in terms of the intelligence that the financial institution has to help you, uh, whether it's manage your credit or service that credit uh, and tech fraud. So, so the, the financial services businesses has always been very much a technology business, but it's become, mm -hmm. technology has become more and more important as we use technologies like AI to improve our ability to predict different as, aspects of our of our yeah. business. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, this, the most common example of that is improving our ability to detect fraud, right. to someone from defrauding you on your credit card. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so there's you know the technology is really embedded in everything we do. Uh, you know, money has moved around digitally today. Yeah. It's all digital. So uh, we really are a technology first company. And I think the, the importance of the experience and, and integrating with everything from an Alexa skill to uh, a, a great mobile experience mm -hmm. uh, really uh, speaks well to the changing demographics of our consumers. Yeah. Well, let's talk a little bit about those demographics because you can't really assume that it's just millennials and younger customers that want all of these high-speed new ways to engage with Synchrony or with their financial providers. Um, talk a little bit about the demographic mix of the customer base that you're serving now and where the points that uh, essentially coordinate well between them, no matter what their age or gender or where they come from in the country. Yeah, so, I mean, we have an omni-channel experience, so people yeah. can connect to us in the way that they feel comfortable. So if they need to call into our call center, they can call in and talk to a human. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and get their problems resolved. 
If they prefer to do that online through a chat bot, we have a chat bot called Sydney and that deployed at all of our different retailers. So mm-hmm. the, regardless of whether you're going to our, you know, one of our retailers uh, like Lowe's or the Gap, you're, you're going to see Sydney on both of those places because mm-hmm. Sydney is, is our service agent for any of the credit products that you might use. Right. So you'll get a consistent experience there. If you decide you want to reach out in other fashions, you know, we've got, uh, so we've got ways for you to reach out and connect regardless of your preference. Mm-hmm. Uh, we see a shift over time in that preference though. We see a lot more uh, interactions through digital channels, through mobile channels than we did in the past. Mm-hmm. And so we're trying to support that shift as we see more and more people working to engage us in, in uh, more contemporary ways. Mm-hmm. Well, and I know that shift has I- impacts internally as well, and like where you need your skills, where you need more people and fewer people. I know we're going to talk about that a little bit as we get into more conversation about AI, um, but uh, the exponential, one of the things you mentioned when we talked beforehand was how how quickly AI and machine learning have become essentially table stakes even at a time when a lot of the less technically minded citizens out there are still think it's something new and cool. It's actually, you know, what did you say that, that if you weren't leveraging machine learning to make decisions as a business these days, you can't compete. Yeah. I think, you know, the thing that's been really eye opening to me is the speed at which technology is changing. Yes. You know, we talked about an exponential rate of change and mm-hmm. then people have a hard time getting their head around, an exponential rate of change. You know, if I walk 30 steps across this room, that's 30 steps. But if I walk 30 exponential steps, that's more than a billion steps. That's 26 <laughs> times around the earth, right? right. So, so the concept of exponential change is really hard to grasp. And we see that across the whole technology spectrum. One of the hardest things about being in technology is the fact that it's changing so rapidly. Yeah. And so how do we keep up? Mm-hmm. It's not just AI, but it's really all of the different fields we work in. And so that includes how do how do our people keep up with the skills that make them current? How do we help them train and retrain and reskill as the mm-hmm. as the game keeps changing and the technology needs shift? Uh, we've seen you know the shift to the cloud and it has mm-hmm. a different set of skill sets. We've seen the shift to uh, you know the data lake and and different ways of analyzing very large amounts of data. And we see a shift to AI and and data scientists and thinking about leveraging data in new ways Mm -hmm. to uh, get better at predictions. So so that whole technology stack that we use at Synchrony from the cloud to the data lake to AI, and then the APIs that unleash that to our application development that we deliver for for our consumers and merchants Mm -hmm. uh, is really a, is, is, the good news is that's a fairly stable stack at that level. It's when you get into the details at each of each of those, and you see all the changes that are going on. Yeah. Uh, wow. AWS is releasing new types of services all the time. Right. As are Google and Microsoft. All the cloud providers have new capabilities coming out all the time. Mm-hmm. The data tools that are out there to manipulate the data, the, the improvements in how you manage and uh, do machine learning are are constantly changing. Yeah. And see. So be really immersed in learning and be comfortable with being a continuous learner to be successful. Mm -hmm. Well, and that reminds me too of how CIOs and CTOs used to have a little bit of a luxury of waiting to see how things were going to work out, becoming fast followers. I, I can't even count the number of CIOs or CTOs who have said to me over the years about, well, we're not on the bleeding edge. We don't want to be on the leading edge. We're going to be fast followers. Um, but, you know, you mentioned the um, the trow of disillusion. You know, the... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah you used a, to be able to get in that. Yeah. There's no time. You have to skateboard right out of that now, don't you? <laughs> That's right. That's right. That. You know, there's a famous, you know, Gartner hype cycle chart that shows yeah. how new technologies get hyped up, but they go through that top of disillusionment mm-hmm. and then they come plateau of productivity. And to your point, you know, a number of years ago, you, you had some time because things weren't moving quite as fast. So yes. You would sort of want to wait and not experience that trough. <laughs> yes. And, and uh, but now you really need to get in uh, to the game quicker because at the pace things are going, you go through that disillusionment phase so fast mm-hmm. that if you're not engaged in the technology early on, then your competitors are going to be ahead of you. Yeah. And it's hard to catch up when, when they're moving that as fast as they're moving. Yeah. If you're sitting at a standstill waiting for some moment to jump in, 
it's it's really hard to catch up in a in a fast moving scene yeah. like that. Now, do you find with the business executives that you deal with at Synchrony, do you find that they are on that same page in terms of the speed? You know that we need to move at this faster than we might have in the past. And give us an example of that, if you could. Yeah, I think I, I'm very fortunate. I think our CEO is very much uh, in in lockstep with the technology strategy and mm -hmm. and believes that the speed is required, understands that that challenge of speed is really helping us think about our business in a forward looking way. Mm -hmm. So I think our, our business leadership is committed uh, to technology and understands that we have to make these investments and move forward in a very agile way. So mm -hmm. we're doing a big push to scale to enterprise agile at Synchrony. And it's not and a lot of people, when they talk about agile, they talk about agile software development, like it's it's just a technology thing. Right. And scaled enterprise agile is an entire business way of thinking. Yes. It's cross-functional teams working together to deliver capabilities mm -hmm. and, and doing it in synchronized two-week sprint that, that deliver functionality to the business and for our customers on a regular reoccurring basis. Yes. And that continuous delivery model is something that the whole business has to be aligned to. You can't have a financial process that's sort of annual, right. you know, that, that thinks about what are we going to be doing a year from now? Well, we've got to be talking about what mm -hmm. are we doing this quarter and what are we doing for the next two weeks? You know, yes. so we've got to be sprinting in very short, short increments. And and so we've got to adapt our entire business to work in that same agile way. It's not just a it's not just a technology methodology. It's really right. a business methodology. Yeah. Are there um how do you approach something, I mean, that big? You've got more than 16,000 employees. Um, it's just, I think your tech, uh, just full-time tech people at Synchrony is over 1,300. It must be an enormous engagement to kind of get everybody on, not just a page about a particular technology, but an agile enterprise itself. What are some of the kind of signs of success that that's yeah. working for you? That type of change isn't something you do overnight. It's no. not something you take. One, one day we work this way in the company and tomorrow we work this way. <laughs> I know, I know. It's like thinking digital transformation is going to happen in a month. Yeah. Right. Whereas it's more like five to seven years. Yeah. Right. So, uh, you know, and with change, one of the most important things is communication and understanding. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. you've got to start with having everybody have a common lexicon and language that they're speaking to, a common vision for what you're trying to achieve. And then I think the, you know, one of the things we've been doing is really lighthouse projects to say, here's the lighthouse project that we want to sort of demonstrate how this works and prove out the theory so that those people that are, oh, I'm not sure that I really understand or like this approach. Is this really going to work for me? Help them to understand it uh, viscerally through the experience of seeing it happen. Mm -hmm. And you know, we've had some, some great success in, in operating in that fashion. And now for some time, and we've grown the size of those teams. Yeah, and the number of those teams really seen huge success. So you know, seventy percent of our development today is is agile, uh, and we expect that to be a hundred percent. And and we're wow. really pushing to make it, you know, really be a business transformation. And mm -hmm. so there's a lot of education up front. There's a yeah. lot of communication throughout, uh, and there's some. You have to do some lighthouse projects to demonstrate it, prove it out, help people see how it works, mm -hmm. and bring, bring the company along. Yes. Well, we got our first question from our, our faithful audience out there, which also reminds me to mention that if you are just tuning in and you are interested in getting a question of your own in front of Greg Simpson, he is the CTO at Synchrony Financial, and he's here to answer questions, not just mine, but yours as well. And our first question is, with so much of the tech landscape changing so rapidly, how does the organization ensure entitlement from the investment? on technology. I'm looking at that yeah, word entitlement and, and that's an interesting way to put it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's, uh, you know, I always think of leadership as managing the paradoxes, right? Because yeah. you have to manage the paradox of doing fast and driving change, but you have to balance that with the need to stick with something long enough to get the value out and, mm -hmm. and get the appropriate financial return and so sometimes you have to pick your battles. And yeah. 
and and say, okay, I'm this is my choice. I'm going to stick with it. And I recognize that it might change. I might have to shift that out in the future, mm-hmm. but I need to stick for a certain amount of time. You know, a simple example is uh, when we first started looking at our chatbot, there were over 160 different chatbot providers. Oh, it was yeah. very clear. And probably right now there's over 200. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there's probably 200. And it was very clear that some that market's going to shake out. Yeah. And there won't, there's not room for 200 different chatbot providers. No. So if you pick one, you could very well pick one that goes away. Yep. You could pick one that's going to get uh, gobbled up by some other competitor or something mm-hmm. like that. You got to recognize and say, "Look, I'm going to I'm going to pick one because it's important to get started." Yep. Except the fact that, and I'm going to develop things as much as possible that I can switch if I need to in the future. Yeah. Uh, and I'm going to ride that out for a certain period of time. And as that market consolidates, maybe there'll be a time in in the future where I need to sh- need to shift. Mm-hmm. You need to go with your eyes wide open that change occurs and that's okay. Yeah. Uh, and you also have to be willing to say, look, I need to, I, I'm going to have to stick with my decision for a little while longer yeah. because if you keep switching around, you, you not only can lose your investment, but you can lose your, your end users. If it's an end user tool and you yeah. keep changing the tool from under them, they're going to get frustrated and say, every time I try to do something, it's a change. Right? That's right. Yeah. I know because there's a lot of the human element in all of this. Because you'd mentioned when I asked you about the how you're addressing all these changing customer expectations, you mentioned that you're spending a lot more time on things like user interface and design to engage with consumers. But there's probably a certain amount of that engagement that also has to take part uh, take place with your employees inside the company. That's right. That's mm-hmm. right. You know, so employee experience is something that's important to us. And, you know, you, you can't forget that as well. You've got to make sure you're thinking about how do we help our employees uh, interact in this digital world? Mm-hmm. You know, we try to, you know, reduce our travel by using technology like video, like we're using today. Yeah. I'm not in the studio with you, but I can interact with you just like I was. Yes. Uh, mm-hmm. we can interview completely virtually. We do a lot of virtual meetings, uh, leveraging video inside Synchrony, Mm -hmm. Uh, but making that easy and consistent and having a a solution that people can can get used to and comfortable with. Yes. And and then, you know, if you switched every time there was a a new leader in that space, you would be switching continuously. Yes. Yes, exactly. You know, a certain cycle, you've got to be willing to change. Mm -hmm. Uh, But it's so frequent that it becomes disruptive. Yes. The... um... We've already got we've got some more great questions. One of them about AI and machine learning, and considering that they are table stakes now, what are your thoughts on? And you'll love this as a CTO who loves this kind of stuff. What are your thoughts on quantum computing and how that might impact encryption security over the next few years? Yeah. So when we look at emerging technologies, we sort of use a radar chart that says, you know, what's happening right now. What's coming on in the next few years and what's a little bit further out. And we sort of try to think about the technologies that are far out. And we also look at it sort of radially around that graph in terms of what's having a small impact, large impact, and a transformational impact. And quantum yeah. computing is something that's having a transformational impact. But in my opinion, it's still it's very far out from, from broad adoption, mm-hmm. right? The, the thing about it is when it, when it does come to fruition, it's a huge impact. Right. So yes. you've got to keep your eye on the ball, mm-hmm. but it's not something the typical industry is going to invest in today. The, the people that are investing in quantum computing work are really the, the IBMs, the Googles, mm-hmm. uh, the ops of the world that are actually building quantum computers. So I think industry is going to when, when quantum computing is available, nobody's going to have one in their in, in their for their company. Mm-hmm. They're going to buy a service from one of the major cloud providers. So you'll go out to a you know Google or a Microsoft or an Amazon or something like that, and you'll you'll acquire quantum computing capability from them because the ability to maintain a stable quantum computer is very difficult. Mm-hmm. And so, I think I think we're a, a ways out from that becoming commercialized. Right. Uh, and and today it's very specialized work. It's very good at large number math. That's why the encryption problem is so critical. So yeah. it, it, it will get to the point where somebody is able to start to, you know, uh, at, at some point in the future, mess with encryption, which is why there's a lot of research being done on how do you come up with encryption that's quantum computing proof, right? Yes. So there's there are people studying that as well. I think we still have some time before it has a big impact in industry. Mm-hmm. Uh, 
one of those things that when it does have an impact, it, w- it will be a very large. Impact. Well, it, it, it reminds me, too, of how big the impact when 5G is universally and easily available. Uh, when I've talked with uh, some CIOs in past discussions like this one and asked them, you know, what is the, the one technology watch that you think will change things the most, most everybody mentions the 5G network. Yeah, I you know I I'm as not as big I'm not as bullish on 5G as being really? transformation. Okay, how and come? I think today we already have the ability to do a lot of the things that we do that we will do with 5G. Uh huh. With with uh, you know fiber optic networks to our building. Okay. And then in that through high speed Wi-Fi, you know our our campuses have high speed wireless access today through Wi-Fi. Right. And 5G will make that available everywhere, mm-hmm. which is, but the reality is there's a lot of work that's done in stationary locations. Now, some of the big things yeah. that 5G does, is places like stadiums, where you've got huge concentrations of people mm-hmm. all in one, and you can connect so many more devices to that south tower, or you can start to maybe come up with some, some competition to the, to the uh, mm-hmm. broadband and all that's there through fiber yeah. and start to provide wireless alternative to that. So there, Interesting. there's certainly some use cases that are big, yeah. but I think in a lot of our use cases that we see in our industry, uh, we're working to deliver some of those capabilities today using a different technology that's maybe more difficult to implement, but the end mm-hmm. result for the consumer is the same. We've got high speed capability that we can deliver in our merchant stores, for example. Yeah. We just use a different way to get it there than 5G mm-hmm. today. Okay. Excellent. Well, good answer. Well, thank you. Um, the one of the things that we talked about as we were getting ready for this interview was uh, you are head of AI. So we talked about the AI strategy that you have underway at Synchrony. And I was looking for kind of practical examples that your outside customers might see. But what you said about it was that it's actually very pragmatic, but more internal because it's about fraud and how you're detecting it. And so essentially, AI is playing a very big role in things that your customers are never going to have to see or deal with because of how you're dealing with it internally. And I have a couple of questions lining up, too, about stopping cyber fraud uh, fraud in uh, the financial industry. So talk a little bit about that, about the AI strategy, what it's doing for Synchrony now. Uh, how you see it developing. Yeah. So our AI strategy, the first thing we did was we had to break down AI because AI is such a big word. It means a lot of things. And there's an old saying that as soon as AI gets turned into something useful, it's no longer called AI, right? So, you know, it's like... It's it's just a feature at that point. It's just a feature at that point. It just becomes something embedded in the technology and people don't think about Mm -hmm. the process that happens. So we had to break AI down. We broke it into three components. We talked about machine learning for improving predictions. Mm-hmm. We talked about intelligent virtual agents for improving customer experience. Okay. And we talked about robotic process automation for improving efficiency. Ah, so then good. from from AI, we said, let's go dive into those three areas and let's let's see what pragmatic results we can get from those three features of AI. Mm-hmm. So in machine learning, it was around how can we improve our prediction? We're lucky in that we have lots and lots of data so we could take data and say how do we predict the next thing somebody's going to buy mm-hmm. and we use that to better target our marketing okay how can we predict that somebody's you know, trying to defraud someone how can we predict that fraud and prevent it mm-hmm. by by taking the data that we have of, of the historical data that we have and looking at patterns to say okay these are known cases of fraud from historical data allowing the computer to understand what are the features that sort of uh, differentiate the fraudsters from the regular customers and yeah. allow the computer to look at all the different features and all the different combinations of those features and come up with an algorithm to predict when somebody's being fraudulent. Mm-hmm. We've seen huge improvements in our ability to detect fraud. Yeah, We've seen big improvements in our ability to predict that the, the next thing somebody's going to buy down to a more detailed level. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so machine learning is all about, you know, taking the mountains of data we have and using it to improve our ability to make decisions, mm-hmm. better, make better decisions. Yeah. Um, the intelligent virtual agent is really that chatbot I talked about, Sydney. Mm-hmm. That's about how to take uh, natural language processing and AI 
and provide a, a much better customer experience. Today, yeah. one of the most hated customer experiences is the IVR, where you dial in and you yeah. press for pushing their pushing buttons. That. I'm sorry, I didn't get that. Could you repeat yourself? Yes, it just drives exactly. people crazy <laughs> pretty quickly. Yeah. Yeah. You just want to ask a question. Yeah. You know, so or what was my transaction last Thursday? Or, yes. you know, yep. how, do I, how do I redeem my loyalty points? You just yes. want to ask your question and have somebody answer it. And mm -hmm. so... Chatbot, the intelligent virtual agent, is about improving that experience and doing that in a, in a multi channel world where mm -hmm. you want to do that through text messaging or through a website or through voice and yeah. talking to the, yep. the virtual agent directly over the phone. You know, let's make that available in whatever channel is most comfortable for you. Mm -hmm. So that was the second big area. So we pushed and delivered Sydney as a chatbot for all, for all of our merchants, and, and that was a big win for us. Yes. And we, we 500,000 cats a month to Sydney today. Wow. And, and it's growing rapidly. So yeah. we see a lot, of, a lot of opportunity to expand that capability uh, into other channels. Mm -hmm. And the third one, robotic process automation, any financial institution and really a lot of different businesses have a lot of back office uh, work that, you know, in, in the old days, IT, there were large monolithic systems and often humans were used to take the data from one large monolithic system massage it in a spreadsheet, feed it into another monolithic system right. and allow them to get to the point they wanted to get to, 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 to answer a question and really start to do cognitive work with the data. Mm -hmm. And so robotic process automation is automating some of that busy work, that rote work and making so the humans can spend more time on the actual cognitive thinking part of the work. Yeah. Well, I like so the way... I like the way you wrote about it in one of your columns, your uh, experiencing digital columns for the IDG Contributor Network. Uh, you referred to RPA as the hands and feet of AI, the robot right. hands and feet. And right. it's, just, it's a Deep good learning, visual. Yeah. The robotic process automation is your hands and feet. And so we try to put those together often to get the best result. Okay. All right. Well, let me go to some of our questions because they're starting to pile up. You've been very popular. Um, and I think you'll enjoy this one. Can you talk a little bit more about how you encourage ideation and curation of new data product ideas across the lines of business at Synchrony? You know, uh, for example, collaboration and visibility and, you know, and that gets into how you uh, encourage and support innovation across the company, outside of IT and into the other business units. So let's dive into that a little. Yeah, a number of years ago, what we did was we launched a, an innovation station and then that grew to four innovation stations. Yeah. And those were, you know, classically the open office space where People could come together in a cross-functional team to drive neat, innovative ideas. But but we realized that you know innovation just isn't in that innovation station. Innovation needs to be culturally everywhere in your company. And so we really yeah. tried to you know use those innovation stations as as hubs. But we really want the we really wanted the innovation to be everywhere. And mm -hmm. so we've driven uh, a lot of. Uh, different things to, to reach out to all the functions of the business and engage them in innovation through things like hackathons. So mm -hmm. <laughs> you might think, well, hackathon, isn't that a technology thing? Well, not necessarily. We've had a number of business teams participate in our hackathons to learn about new technology yeah. and apply it in, in whatever way they felt was most exciting to them. Mm -hmm. and so uh, robotic process automation is a great example. We had over 100 people uh, or uh, maybe even 100 teams of people that that, that got together and worked on using robotic process automation tools to demonstrate how it could help make their job better. And so we engaged a lot of dialogue and, and interaction across the company about that. Mm -hmm. And we have sessions on things like on each of our pillars of AI that are open to the business to come in and, and talk and communicate and share best practices and ideas. Uh, so the hackathons is one big success, the, the cross-functional sharing sessions and lunch and learns we do is another area mm -hmm. the uh, other the other thing we do is a something called a bolt session yeah which was started by our innovation stations and that's bolt as in lightning bolt right as in like, lightning, bolt, lightning right? bolt yeah i thought like that was back to the need for speed right we're all yeah. about how can we do these things quickly yes and if you're familiar with the hackathon idea it's typically you know people want to develop something overnight mm -hmm. well the bolt we wanted the same thing but it, instead of a technology it was all about a business problem. Here's a business problem a merchant has. Often it's one of our, our customers, a merchant. It'll say, hey, here's a problem I'd like solved. 
and they come in to the innovation station and we work to deliver a solution for them overnight. So mm-hmm. we, we try to do that same sort of wow. stay up all night hackathon kind of model yeah. to solve an actual business problem. And you may have a, you may have to do some work to productionize it afterwards, but if you can demonstrate how that problem solved overnight, mm-hmm. you know, that type of speed is transformational for the customer. Yeah. They're used to things taking years when they talk to IT. I always, I, get, have, I always have to wonder about hackathons. Is there a magic element there in that you're staying up all night and eating too much pizza? What is it, <laughs> what is it that people like about staying up all night? <laughs> To work. Yeah, just, is, do you yeah, do that too? <laughs> uh, yeah, I've, I've done that on occasion. I yeah. think I think the uh, I think the power is just you know driving to a goal and having a finish line. So by yeah. putting a finish line out there and say, okay, eleven o'clock tomorrow morning, you're going to tell us about your product that you produced. Okay, you've got a deadline, and you're you're. It's like a race. You're racing to get across that deadline first. Huh. You want to have the product. Yeah. So it becomes very competitive. So our teams are competing. Yeah. And they're competing for prizes. So we're giving out fun technology prizes uh, to the winning. <laughs> so and, and, and they're it, excited to, up to, to do that. It just wouldn't have the same vibe if you were doing it nine to five. Yeah, yeah. It, it's, it's not the same. Okay. All right. Fair enough. I want to take a pause now. If you have, uh, if you are just joining us, we're about a half hour into talking with Greg Simpson, who is the CTO at Synchrony Financial. We've been talking about hackathons and bolt lightning uh, gatherings of the business and tech people at Synchrony and the way they're coming up with new ideas. And I've been getting lots of questions from the audience. So please keep sending them in. We'll see if we can get to most or all of them. Here's a question for you, Greg. With data breaches providing the threat act out there with huge amounts of data. Do you for, foresee AI being used to enable the kind of fraud that might be able to hide from fraud detection tools? That's a pretty good question. Yeah, yes. Un- unfortunately, I think... It's not you know, only the good guys who have the AI tools, in other words. Yeah. <laughs> cybersecurity is a cat and mouse game where, yeah. you know, we'll try to use AI to protect us and the bad guys will try to use AI to help them win. Yeah. You know, it's a battle, it's a constant battle. Yep. Uh, relation of, of, of arms uh, in the cyber, uh, you know, wars that we have around defending that data. And, and it's, so it's, it's, it's a constant challenge. You know, you think about, uh, you know, cyber crime is really a big business today. There mm-hmm. are a whole marketplace that sell credit cards online. Sure. That we illegally obtain. And they get together and they have their meetings and they have their hackathons to try to figure out how to develop new tools to uh, mm-hmm. uh, infiltrate institutions. And at the same time, we ha- that's why we have to be so diligent at leveraging the best technology to try to prevent those things. Yes. Uh, close those doors as fast as they're open. So it's, yeah. uh, it's unfortunately, it's a constant battle. It's, it's, it's unfortunate that we have people that feel the best way they can spend their time and wish they would spend it on something more productive. Yeah. Well, uh, t- talk a little bit about um, the way you are building up data science and new and more sophisticated cybersecurity skills inside of Synchrony. I mean, I, I know you so, can't talk in detail yeah. about your security strategy. That's just crazy these days. But t- yeah, we tell don't us, really do that. Yeah, we, tell we, us what we, you can about it. Strategy bringing talent in because one of the most important parts of any strategy is your people. And so we've done some great uh, university partnerships. If you think about the University of Illinois, where we build an emerging technology center, that's in my team that, that, you know, the emerging technology Mm -hmm. center, we've got 40 interns ranging from undergraduates to PhD students Mm -hmm. working on technology product projects that are fairly leading edge uh, with our company, with, with company sponsors, employee sponsors, but in addition to delivering some really great work, it's a great pipeline of talent for us to hire into the company. And so we can get people that we can make sure that we're comfortable with the type of work they do. Mm-hmm. They can make sure that they're comfortable with the culture that Synchrony brings to them Yeah. and can find the right matches. And we can have a, a pipeline to bring great talent into the company that has the contemporary skills we need to compete in today's marketplace, mm-hmm. be it development or in cyber or in cloud or whatever, whatever the, the, the discipline is, data yeah. engineering and so uh, We've also got a, a university partnership with the University of Connecticut mm-hmm. around, we've, we've sponsored a cyber chair there and we've got 
a new development program going on there with new inter- and and we're doing some some really neat things. We just did our first hackathon at the University of Connecticut. Yeah. Uh, so we've got an engagement there. We're bringing in a pipeline again of talent around development, around cybersecurity. We're working with mm-hmm. them on projects that they can take to the classes so that the university can work on real life problems. Mm-hmm. And, and so the students can learn how to engage in in these disciplines and, and help us get the best and brightest working on cyber defenses. Yeah. Now you're um, you're coming to us from Kettering, Ohio. So you are based in Ohio. Are there any similar plans to uh, hook up with universities or I don't know, student uh, pipelines there as well? Well, the University of Illinois is not too far from here. Uh, oh, we, do do recruiting. Mm-hmm. we do do recruiting at a number of universities um, in the area as well. Mm-hmm. So Miami University is very close to this Kettering location. So we've, we've hired a number of great students from Miami University here in Ohio. So shout out to the Red Hawks there. Um, so, you know, we look, you know, the nice thing about Kettering is there are a number of great universities within uh, a close distance with Ohio State and mm-hmm. uh, University of Cincinnati, Miami, and so on. We've got uh, a, a, a rich uh, set of students to draw from, mm-hmm. uh, back into our programs. Uh, and we chose the University of Illinois because of the uh, level of depth in their program around this university uh, corporate sponsorship. And they've got a, you know, their research park being right next to the campus that really enables the students to to come and work whenever they need to. That that worked out really well. Mm-hmm. And they've got a very strong data science and data analytics program there and computer science uh, program there. So it's it was a good fit for us. And, and from a business uh, location perspective, mm-hmm. we've got a data analytics center of excellence in Chicago. Okay. And a lot of University of Illinois people like to go to Chicago. So that was one of the draws there. University of Connecticut, obviously a big draw into our headquarters at Stanford. So, you know, we continue to look at opportunities. Right now, those are our two big partnerships, but we mm-hmm. uh, we draw a number of universities and we continue to expand it. Great. Well, I always think it's a really smart thing for enterprises in any industry, really, to be hooking up more tightly with universities and groups of students that way. I mean, when you think back to the way uh, computing arose as a real enterprise concern, it goes back to the 70s and 80s when big companies were doing exactly that. So it's kind of good. Yeah. To, it's good to see that back in vogue again. Um, one of the questions I have from our audience here is actually about whether you know of any blockchain use cases. You are the CTO, so I'm sure you keep your eye on blockchain. And I yeah. often find when I talk to CIOs about it, they may be playing around with it, but there aren't that many actual, practical, real-world use cases that they're familiar with in their industry. What about in the financial services industry? Yeah, so in financial services, you know, we've got a care credit business that we, we try to figure out how to create charges between the provider, the insurance company, the consumer. Mm-hmm. That's the kind of place that a blockchain transparent ledger could could play a role. And so we look at those types of use cases. Um, we don't have any production blockchain mm-hmm. uh, examples out there today, but we've uh, it's an area that we're experimenting. We're trying different things. Um, and so I think there are definitely some use cases around, you know, connecting consumers with providers and, mm-hmm. and especially more than two. When there's multiple parties involved. Yeah. That's when I, the, the transparent ledger becomes very helpful. Right. Well, I've, I've heard one place I keep hearing it coming up is when I talk with higher ed CIOs. You know, the idea of being able to track all your educational information across different universities and programs and so forth. So I think that, you know, very much uh, the way we watch different technologies, it will eventually, right now it seems more like that technology in search of a solution kind of thing, but I, that well, will I reverse one, itself. <laughs> one of the challenges is I've seen some really interesting startups using blockchain to try to do identity management, right? And, yes. And, uh, that's a, I think it's a great use case to help people to be able to, you know, imagine being able to log on to any website anywhere through a, a single uh, certified unified ID. Mm-hmm. Uh, problem is, you know, a lot of companies try to provide that service from their own sort of place because they yeah. want that data, they yeah. want to uh, capture that. So there's this economic sort of disincentive around corporations you know, a lot of people log into websites using their Google account or using mm-hmm. their Facebook Facebook account. Exactly. And, and those become sort of their their centralized identity. And that has 
and those companies like that because they get a lot of data and information yeah. about how you work. Uh, the idea of a centralized blockchain uh, community that could do that would be great, mm -hmm. but there's no central entity that's getting the, the economic benefit that's going to fund the effort to do it. Yeah. And so it's hard to that sort of thing jump started because you really need a large body of a uh, number of users to really make it take off. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and that, that gets to toward one of I, I've, what I've always seen as kind of one of the central problems in the technology industry is that there's no real, um, there's no really good reason or that at least there didn't used to be for different technology vendors to create technologies that easily integrated with all the others. You know, it used to be, we want you on our platform, you know, it's, it's our right. way or the highway. Um, and I mean, eventually that, you know, has changed a lot, especially with cloud computing and that sort of thing, but you still see it popping up in some of the new areas, you know, the, the yeah, buy my that, stuff, know, not their stuff. Right. That's gotten a lot better. And, you know, yeah. our company, for example, we, really want merchants to be able to plug into our digital ecosystem easily. Mm -hmm. So we develop an API portal yeah. that allows them to connect to our services very easily. So if they're a digitally savvy company, mm -hmm. it's very easy for them to connect and leverage our services uh, in their in their product. And that's a big competitive advantage because that, that API approach allows them to you know control some of that customer experience but get the benefits of our our banking knowledge and our financial services products mm -hmm. uh, and through a medium that makes sense to the to the technology digitally savvy company. Yes, there. yes. Well, and that plays in very nicely to one of our questions we have queuing up here. Uh, and I think you'll especially like this one. It seems like a real CTO kind of centri centric question. What are the significant improvements in technology that have most helped your business? Yeah, I think the... Um, that's a good question. Mm -hmm. most of our business, I think, you know, refactoring our applications into microservices uh, is probably mm -hmm. the one of the biggest impacts to our company. You know, we had a lot of monolithic applications, and we spent uh, the last few years uh, building out our cloud strategy. And by that, I, I don't mean, you know trying to consolidate data centers. You know, a lot of companies think about the cloud as a way to reduce data center costs. That's the, we were lucky in the fact that we spun off and created, you know, we were created as a company five years ago, a little over five years ago. That's right. We had spun nice out of GE. Mm -hmm. and, and, but we only had two. We didn't have, we didn't need to consolidate a bunch of old infrastructure and legacy stuff into a, uh, somebody else's data center. But what we did need is a way to take those big monolithic applications, mm -hmm. divide microservices, so that those services can be provided as APIs out to our merchant. And that enabled uh, a better connection into our services. Mm -hmm. uh, and we got all those other cloud benefits too. So it does give us the flexibility to rent you know, capacity on demand or you know, auto scale you know, capacity on demand. Yeah. So it gives you the, some of the, the infrastructure cloud benefits, but more importantly, it really, that refactoring the applications and the microservices gives us that API portal that allows our customers to come in and, and, and plug into our services easily yeah. and consistently. So if you come and ask Synchrony a question in any channel, you should get the same result because they're all going to use the same microservice. That's, right. that's, the, that's how that vision comes together as you start to break out these monoliths into these various microservices. Yeah. And that ultimately results in faster development and, mm -hmm. and new and well, delivery and that, of new And that is a really, it's a nice luxury to have. Uh, you said at one point that you've essentially from the beginning been able to treat the whole organization like itself as an agile project. Right, yeah. right. Yeah, I love that. I've never heard anybody refer to a company that way. And that actually ties into another one of the questions about in this very agile-centric world, the agile enterprise that you have going at Synchrony, who is more often driving the bank's strategy? Is it the business side or is it you in your CTO capacity? I guess the question yeah, is, are, I, are you running the whole show there, Greg? <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I don't use the term business versus technology that i think you. that's the, good the old model and mm -hmm. a we are all the business technology is the business the other functions are the business and it's you know the real success is that cross-functional partnership and that's how agile works mm -hmm. agile is not a tech, it's a cross-functional partnership 
of all the various functions and yes. each of the functions has their, their place. And together we deliver value for our customers. Mm-hmm. Uh, all have the same customer base. We're all trying to achieve the same goals. So sharing those goals across those functions, you know, I, I don't subscribe to the business versus technology mantra. Good, good. I think I I know I, for one, am just sick and tired of that divide. I just a couple of years ago, I started railing against using the term aligning the idea of IT alignment with business. I think IT is actually accelerating business. And I, right. I go around calling alignment the uh, scarlet A of the technology industry. It's you don't want to be running to catch up with somebody else's strategy. You actually need to be and should be at the table while it's being developed. Um, final question I will have for you. As I told you, our 45 minutes went streaking by very quickly. And I'm, I'm apologetic to all of the folks that sent in questions that we couldn't get to all of them. Um, but we absolutely encourage you to stay in touch with us and connect through LinkedIn and, and send those questions along. Um, leadership lessons that you have learned as the CTO. You have spent a lot of your career being the chief person in charge of all the technology. What are some of the, for all the other CTOs out there, what are some of the um, lessons you've learned about the best way to lead technology at such big organizations? Uh, I think one of the things I would say is to stay humble. Mm-hmm. You, need to listen. you need to listen to your people. Um, you need to listen to new ideas. Now, often you might be called upon to make a decision, but you should be making that decision based on the input of of your teams mm-hmm. and leverage them to help drive that strategy forward. They need to be part of it. It's not it's not about you, the CTO. It's about the CTO organization. And if you leverage the power of all the people that work for you, you'll be much more successful than if you just try to do it yourself. Okay. Very good advice. Thank you so much. It was wonderful having you here today, and it was just a really fascinating conversation. So we thank Great. you for making the time. So thank you very much. Yes, yes, sir. So if you have joined us too late to catch all this live, never fear. You can catch this full episode later today on CIO.com. Or you can uh, tap into YouTube where the IDG Tech Talk channel uh, has not only this uh interview with Greg Simpson, the CTO at Synchrony, but all the other three dozen that we have done before this. We are entering our third year of CIO Leadership Live as we roll over into 2020. And please make sure that you join us for our next episode, which will be streamed live onto LinkedIn, Twitter, and YouTube. We'll be here again next Wednesday, December 18th at noon Eastern. And I'll be joined here in the studio by Michael Salas, who is the Senior Vice President and Chief Information and digital officer for Suez North America. So just as a parting note, please subscribe to our YouTube channel, IDG Tech Talk, where you can find everything you need to know about CIO Leadership Live. And thanks so much for being with us today, and I hope you'll join us again next time. Take care.